not everybody would buy one. It would be very much like records, perhaps ten dollars a piece, rather than rather than quite a bit bit much more. Neil, we've been trying to get a handle on the volume of this problem, and you happen to have a catalog there from the West Coast Computer Connection. Show it to us. Right. Let me show you this. This is one of the more brazen operations. This is a multi-page catalog uh, listing uh, uh, just uh, scads and scads of titles of pirated software, documentation, uh, including some of the cracking programs and Locksmith. Uh, uh, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Locksmith is on both sides of these. They have a problem with their, their proprietary software being pirated as mm -hmm. well. Okay, what was the West Coast Computer Connection doing and what happened to them? Well, what they were doing was uh, they were marketing uh, mail order. They were making contacts, not through bulletin boards. Uh, this, was a, this was a few months ago. Not, not through bulletin boards that we knew about, really, but through the, through the advertising and through the marketing catalogs being distributed. Uh, and what we, d what we did there, it turns out this happened to be, and I'm not, I'm not saying everybody's going to get by so easily, but it happened to be some, some juveniles, and because of the concern uh, about that, uh, we really uh, went over and visited them and explained the seriousness of this, and, uh, and they agreed to cut it out. We have a written agreement from them that they would discontinue it. Uh, the, ro the remedies under the law are much stronger, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we may want to mm -hmm. talk about that. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll be back in just a minute. As we heard, some people suggested if software were cheaper, then there wouldn't be the motivation to have piracy. Wendy Woods took a look at that idea. Overlooking the San Francisco Bay, and here in this little garage, is one of the most revolutionary software businesses in the United States. Welcome to Headland Press. This is the home of Freeware, specifically PC Talk, a communications program that's not copy protected. In fact, each shipment encourages piracy. You can copy freely every single diskette in a unique approach to software sales. I think what we've done is just address the whole notion of copy protection and piracy uh, in a different way. And rather than uh, restricting access to the program and appealing to people's dishonesty, uh, we're giving wide access to the program and appealing to their honesty. This mom and pop operation claims one out of ten people who copy PC Talk will pay the suggested $35 fee, and their letters tell the tale of appreciation. Well, all this is fine and good, but what does it mean for support? That's usually the biggest part of a software company's budget, and Headland Press stays on the phone quite a lot. What do they do if people haven't paid for the program? And we really found that we did better business by giving out the information and if someone was using it and, we, and, uh, and hadn't paid and we could help them use the program then they'd be more likely to pay us. Flugelman thinks the rest of the industry should take a lesson. He's getting important feedback, business and appreciation because of his philosophy. He's not getting rich but he is getting a surprising amount of gratitude. Reporting for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Thank you, Wendy. Joining us now is a young man who we're going to call Frankie Mouse. That's not his real name, uh, but the guy who we're calling Frankie Mouse is a pirate, and he's going to show us quite an incredible demonstration. Gary? You know, Stuart, I think it's one of the important things we, we should mention is that by showing these activities on, on the show here, we're not really condoning them in any way. In fact, we're not condoning them at all. Uh, but I think it's a rare opportunity for us to get a chance to see just exactly what pirating is all about. Frankie, what's going on here? Okay, we're logged on to a bulletin board right now, and... Um, what you see on the screen are titles of text files that you can look at. Um, the ones of interest right here are like basics of cracking 101, etc. If you're not already a pirate, these will tell you how to. There's a little course in how to be. How Basically, to yeah, something. there's many, many parts to it. In fact, not all of it is displayed here. There's much more than what you see here. And these are Apple II oriented. Uh, if you want to look at one, just type the number of it, and it will start scrolling across the screen right here. I would like to have brought a 1200 baud modem. It would have gone a lot mm -hmm. faster. Okay, so this but is one of your how-to text files on a kind of... Basically, right. Well, first of all, they're not mine. Somebody, Somebody else has is. written these, and basically they go all over the country. But yeah, I this, mean, is a, this is a, a bulletin board, that, uh, a local bulletin board uh, that people dial into from, we say, all over the country. So how many right. people, are let's say, would be involved in this particular activity here? With well, this it all depends board. on the board. Some mm -hmm. boards have got as few as 100 members. Some boards have got two and 3,000 members. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so can we go on, on this bulletin board and actually get a piece of, uh, of pirated software? Uh, there are items like that that exist. Um, for the Apple II especially, they're called AE lines. And that's, uh, it's not really a bulletin board, but it uh, is a way of allowing you to call that computer and download files that have already been cracked. Um, this particular bulletin board does not have anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. How, many, how many bulletin boards are like this throughout the country, just as a guess? Do you have any idea at all? Hundreds or? Uh, hundreds, maybe thousands. Mm -hmm. I have really no mm -hmm. idea. 
they're all over the place, though. How do you feel about that? I mean, you feel like it's a, a why do you why do you do this? What's the what's the reason? Well, unlike um, West Coast Computer Connection here, um, the, we don't do anything like that for profit. Basically, it's just for fun and recognition. I mean, if you have a popular name, such as um, you mentioned the name Mr. Crackman to any pirate and they'll know who you're talking about. They won't know who he is personally, but they'll know who you're referring to. So the, the, your interest is, is in the, I guess, in the, in, in the fun that you would have in actually cracking the program, and uh, that's the activity that, that it's is It's kind of like a game, mm -hmm. right. And, you know, you're outsmarting the software makers. Do you feel like that has any, um, um, are there any moral issues at all that, uh, that you're worried about? Well, you, can, you can't deny it. I guess it is stealing. I mean, you didn't pay for it, and now you have it. I mean, you've got it somewhere. That's, that's stealing. Mm -hmm. Um, I really can't say, though, how much software companies lose in revenue because, um, first of all, a uh, copy, copied program is like um, free advertising in a way because it goes out. And among me and my friends, there, we have sort of a code of honor that we follow. If we have a program and we use it a lot, we like it, we will go out and buy it simply so we have the manuals and the support and all that stuff. Frankie, if you could log off here, and I want you to show me your pirate of DB Master in a second. And Neil, while Frankie's doing that, how do you react to what you just heard from Neil as a guy who represents software publishers? Well, I think there's both a moral issue here and a legal issue. As we talked about before, and, uh, you know, Frankie didn't hear that, but he may, he may catch it later. Uh, really, the fact that people are using this software and not paying for it really means the software is a lot more expensive. And I think that there's an economic issue here that they really, uh, if everybody was using it paid a small amount, we probably probably have the price drop dramatically. The second part is illegal, and I'm happy to hear Frankie admit that it is, in fact, stealing. It is, in fact, a, crimin a criminal act. There's a copyright infringement has been a crime and uh, continues to be a crime. You can get a year in jail, perhaps more uh, monetary fines, as well as use of trademarks, where you do use the name of the trademark when you have a new criminal statute, criminal counterfeiting statute that provides uh, up to five years in jail. So, it, Okay, sure. uh, let's go back to Frankie. What do you have here now, Frankie? Okay, this is a popular program for the Apple II known as DB Master. Um, and it's protected like crazy. You can't copy it conventionally. Uh, what, what did we, you do? What we've done to it is we've totally opened it up. I mean, you can copy it from basic right now. There's no protection whatsoever. And one thing that we found that was interesting when we did it is that DB Master is written for a large part in basic. Mm -hmm. I mean, most, most commercial programs are written in assembly language. So we're in, in, in the process of copying this right now, listing now. Right. What, I mean, what would it take, Frankie, for you to, to buy a program? I'm not sure I understand. Well, what rather, than for, rather than steal it. So is there any incentive that, that a manufacturer could, could uh, provide for you to, to buy that program? Well, like I say, if I have a program that I use a lot, mm -hmm. I'll buy it for the manuals and for the support. Okay. So I guess what I could say is to put out good manuals and support the product. Okay, gentlemen, Frankie and Neil, thanks a lot. Now, as we see, this is a complex issue with problems of morality and ethics and price and so on. Commentator Paul Schindler has some thoughts on the whole problem of piracy. Avast! I'll bet you never thought of old Paul Schindler as a pirate. But you know, there are some people who do. And that takes us to the heart of the software piracy question. Is it moral or isn't? Now, that's a hard question to answer, but I can tell you that software piracy is illegal and the definition is pretty simple. It's piracy if you give away a commercial software program. That's right, you're a pirate even if you give it away. Now, most people don't think it's immoral unless you sell the program. Those two views are irreconcilable, and they cause a great deal of controversy in the software industry. As a result, software developers are constantly looking for ways to prevent software piracy. One of the most common, and the dumbest, is copy proofing. Copy proofing causes a lot of problems that I'm not going to get into right now. But the fact of the matter is that what's worst about copy proofing is that it attacks the symptoms, not the cause, of software piracy. In my opinion, high prices cause software piracy. Now, I know that Lotus costs $700 because the developers want to make their money back. But the fact of the matter is that corporations can afford prices like that and private individuals can't. Whether it's moral or not, expensive software is pirated a lot more frequently than cheap software. So my solution to software piracy is for developers to figure out a way to make cheaper software. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler.
random access file this week. Imagine it's April 15th, almost midnight, and instead of rushing down to the post office to drop in your tax returns, you simply turn on your modem and download the old 1040 to Uncle Sam. The IRS says it is looking into electronic tax filing, including sending in a return on a floppy disk. One IRS analyst said he thought there could be electronic filing within five years. Meanwhile, just like Christmas baubles in October, software store shelves are filling up with tax preparation programs. There are an estimated 50 tax programs in the market this year, ranging in price from about $50 to more than $300. Some just help you prepare your returns. Others actually help you in tax planning. Here's a list of five of the most well-known tax programs and their prices. Most of the tax software is available available for the IBM PC and the Apple line. The IRS, by the way, has cracked down on the rules regarding tax deductions for home computers. Under the revised law, you can only take the full tax deduction for your PC if you use it at least 50% of the time for legitimate business purposes. And using your computer to analyze personal investments will not count as part of that. Best to check with your accountant. Well, along with electronic tax filing, electronic job finding is growing. There are now five online job databases in the country. Business Week magazine says employers are warming to the efficiency of doing online searches for prospects since they can add or subtract qualifying criteria and so narrow or broaden the pool as needed. American computer manufacturers are poised for the impending invasion of the Japanese MSX computers, but no one seems too worried. Most analysts seem to think the Japanese PCs will offer too little too late. MSX machines were introduced in Europe late last year and have so far received a cool reception. How about a warm reception for our software reviewer, Paul Schindler? If you don't recognize these moves, you probably never played pinball. Now, I'm not talking video games here. I'm talking the real thing, a little steel ball moving down through a gadget-filled field. You know, I can still remember the first time I found out that real pinball players deliberately bumped the game and felt the rhythm of the tilt detectors in order to try to avoid a tilt. Now, why am I telling you about all this? Because the true pinball experience has been captured by a game called Night Mission Pinball. Now, this is not one of those games where you get to design the pinball game. The basic design's locked in. But while you can't install things just where you want them, you can control every other aspect of the game. Ball speed, friction, kicker power, bonus points, bumper resilience. I still remember at MIT, whenever people would start winning too many games, they'd deaden the bumpers. Talk about realism! When you start Night Mission Pinball, you see quarters on the screen dropping into a slot. And you can bump this game. But if you bump it too hard, it tilts. This is the finest simulation of a physical game I've ever seen. Hats off to Suv Logic, Champaign, Illinois, the people who, for just $40, bring you Night Mission Pinball. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. Commodore says it will lay off more than 500 workers from its plants in Pennsylvania and California. Commodore says inventories are high, due in part to slower than expected Christmas sales. Hewlett Packard reportedly will be coming out with an upgrade of its Model 110 portable. The new version will feature a 24-line display, 512K of RAM, and a price tag under $2,000. It reportedly will not come with bundled software in ROM. Software Access International just completed a survey of computer users to see what they do with their computers. Results, an average user spends 12.2 hours a week with his PC, and about half of the time is spent on work, the other half on games. There's a new game out called Comex the Game by the Commodity Exchange in New York. It's a sophisticated simulation of real commodities trading where money can be made and lost real fast. The exchange says it is selling the software in the hopes that users will then move from the game to the real thing. Finally, you've seen those personals columns in the newspaper, you know, single white male, Sikhs, etc. Well, you guessed it. New York Magazine, the famed repository for the cryptic lust-wanted ads, has a new electronic mail network called XNet. It is essentially a personals bulletin board in which New Yorkers can post their desires for dates. XNet says about 300 hungry hopefuls have signed up for the service. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.